guess uh, Dr. Huxtable? Carl Winslow from Family Matters. Loved Carl Winslow. Oh, I watched a lot of Leave it to Beaver, so probably Ward Cleaver. You know, never made mistakes. He always hit the ball out of the park every time. I was excited, but I was surprised at the same time. Uh, I was actually cleaning out our cat's litter box, so it was, it was a pretty weird situation. A little bit scared, a little bit nervous, but excited. I guess uh, the first thought I had was, uh, okay, I've got to start making a lot of money now. My dancing, they don't like my <laughs> The old dance move. I don't know yet because because nothing embarrasses a two-year-old. They embarrass you right now. <laughs> I could see if she were to bring a guy home, sitting there in a tank top and some short shorts with my belly hanging out, uh, just to show this guy who's boss, sort of. She does not like it when we roll the window down after we drop her off of school and say, love you, sis. Uh, she doesn't like that. Um, so I'm probably gonna keep doing that. The discipline, disciplinary part of it sometimes, you know, you talk to them and you want them to act and behave a certain way and obviously they have their own agenda at times. For me, it's finding a balance between work and, and, being, uh, and being a husband and, and being a dad. Later in the years, you know, as the kids all get grown and it's been, I guess, the hardest thing is just, uh, you know, they don't want your opinion unless they, uh, you know, unless they ask you, so you gotta be kinda careful what you say. To see your own kids grow up and have their own children, it's just a joy that's indescribable. A blessing every day is to see what your kids are doing and uh, knowing that you were a big part of their life. I always told the kids, I raised them perfect, and if they didn't turn out that way, it's their own fault. To be a, a good forgiver, not to hold grudges. Being faithful, being a good example to, you, to, you, to your wife, for your children. Definitely being there, it wasn't the case for me. And so I have always sort of purpose that when I do become a dad, that I would always be there for my kids, always. It's everything. It's my relationship with God is, is, is the example that I want it, that I have for them. Living by God's word is, uh, it, I mean, it, it really was. I, it really was a key to our life. There's times when I realized whenever he was crying and it's really not that big of a deal where I'm there and I'm telling him, hey, it's, oh, it's okay, I got you. I'm holding him. It's like I have that moment where I've, I've felt like this is what God is doing to us. Uh, he's telling us it's okay, I've got you, but we're kind of, freaking out because we think it's a big deal. Seeing my daughter for the first time, uh, there, there's just immediately, there's I love this person so much and there's literally nothing that I would not do. And so it's it's really changed my perspective of God and the, I mean, how much more he loves us. It's, it's unreal. Amen to that one. I uh, wore my special uh, father's tie today uh, in honor of this day. My son was born 33 years ago. And uh, my wife and I went through the parenting classes at Audubon Hospital, you know, learn all the stuff you're supposed to know. And um, we got this, uh, I got this tie, which um, I guess you're supposed to be wearing when that moment comes. Uh, when you've got to run to the hospital. Um, but anyway, it says this. Number one, stay calm. Number two, call doctor. Number three, call hospital. Number four, insurance ID. Number five, enough gas. Uh, number six, don't forget wife's suitcase. Number seven, don't forget wife. That's my favorite. And number eight's a map, and they got a little map here to how to get to Ottoman Hospital. And down at the bottom it says, congratulations, Dad. So um, I broke it out just for Father's Day today. I think I've only worn it once or maybe two other times. So um, 
But, you know, I think today, you know, we've kind of moved away from a tie generation. I think they need to start putting it on guys' shirts upside down, you know, it's a T-shirt, so they can look at that and maybe be just as effective. But I don't know if hospitals do that kind of cool stuff anymore. So, um, anyway, if they do, great. That's wonderful. I want to talk to you today um, from Genesis chapter 13 and 19 and also Job 1. So if you brought Bibles, uh, there's two areas that we'll be uh, looking a little bit at today. I want to share a, a quote with you that's been always challenging and, and thought-provoking for me. And it says, you can use most any measure when speaking of success. You can measure it in lovely homes, expensive cars, or dress. But the measure of your real success is one you cannot spend it's a way your child describes you when talking to their friends. How our kids talk about us. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting. And uh, how our kids look at us uh, are, are things that are uh, important. It says a lot about the relationship we have with them. And I, I realize probably uh, all of our kids have times have told their friends that we're goofy and we embarrass them and all those things like you saw in the video. And that's probably true. Uh, no question about that. But when they, they sit back and look at the larger scope of our influence, what do they really say about us? And so I want to say happy Father's Day to those of you in our audience today. And uh, certainly uh, I treasure you and what you're striving to do in the lives of your kids and, and your grandkids and um, as those come along. You know, dads are important to their children. Um, I, I think we, uh, we sometimes give dads the back burner spot. Like, you know, I, I know moms are significant. I would never downplay that at all uh, in the lives of their kids. But dads have a very important role too. And I, and I like Father's Day for that reason. Because I think Father's Day is one of those times when uh, it kind of moves more to the forefront. And uh, I know watching uh, different TV shows and comedies and different things, a lot of times guy, dads are looked at as goofy and dumb and, you know, they just don't know how to do anything and they're better off if they weren't around and all this kind of stuff. And I think, you know, some of that's kind of funny, but it gets to a point where, you know, you still have to realize that dads have a significant role in families. And, and I realize that not every family has a, has a dad figure. Um, sometimes not by choice, and uh, I realize that, that things have to be done differently, but uh, how, much, how much greater it can be uh, when the dad's in the picture, the dad's involved as God wants the dad to be, and what a difference that makes in the, in the lives of the, of the children. As much as we praise the contributions of moms, we should also praise the contributions of godly dads and what they're doing in the lives of their kids. There was a... Uh, Dr. Ronald P. Rahner, uh, Rahner he's the director of uh, the Center for the Study of Parental Acceptance and Rejection at uh, University of Connecticut in Stores. And um, Stores, Connecticut. I don't want you to think I was talking about just stores. But anyway, um, he did a review of about 100 studies on the role of uh, parenting and what goes on between 1949 and 2001. He kind of did a review of those things. And made the point that researchers have found that overall the love or rejection of mothers and fathers equally affect kids' behavior, self-esteem, uh, emotional stability, and mental health. And he, he quoted, he said, but in some cases, the withdrawal of a father's love seems to play a bigger role in kids' problems with personality and psychological adjustment, delinquency, and substance abuse. He goes on to say, the issue is not who's more important, but recognizing that dads are key in all the ways that moms are, that there is a, a major role there um, as God intends. So again, I, I think it's, uh, it's good to, uh, to see those things emphasized and, and realize the importance is a challenge to, to dads that are continuing to work and, and serve and find ways to minister and take care of their kids and their grandkids. I read a very interesting article this week that I'd, I'd love to recommend to you. It's called The Involved Father. Uh, it's written by a man by the name of Glenn Stanton. Shows up in the Focus on the Family. Uh, one of the issues back through the years, you can certainly go to The Involved Father, Focus on the Family. You can find that article. But I just want to share with you a couple things that he, um, he states in there. Several contributions to the job of parenting that a dad brings and how a good balance between parents is so important for kids. He says, first of all, that by eight weeks of age, by eight weeks of age, infants can tell the difference between their mother and their father's interaction with them. He says, whether they realize it or not, children are learning by sheer experience that men and women are different and have different ways of relating to uh, other adults 
uh, dealing with life in general, dealing with children. And they, they, they start learning these things through experience by eight weeks. He goes on to say the fathers tickle more and they wrestle. And I think that's true of a lot of us sitting in this audience today. We've done a lot of that. Uh, fathering expert John Snarney says that children who play rough with their dads learn that biting, kicking, and other forms of physical violence are not acceptable. In this type of play, they learn self-control by being told when enough is enough and when to settle down. And girls and boys both learn a healthy balance between timid and aggressive behaviors through the father and some of the rough housing that we do, uh, as he's talked about, and what a neat time that is. But often we don't think of what that provides in the lives of our kids. He mentions also to go to any playground and listen to the parents. He says, who is encouraging kids to swing or to climb just a little bit higher? Who is encouraging them to ride their bike a little faster or throw that ball a little bit harder? And who is encouraging the kids to be careful? He says mothers protect and dads encourage kids to push the limits. And either of these parenting styles by themselves can be very unhealthy, but he says that together they help children to remain safe while expanding their experiences and increasing their confidence. He says a major study showed that when speaking to children, mothers and fathers are different. Mothers will simplify their words and try to speak on the child's level, which helps immediate communication. Why men are not as inclined to modify their language for the child, which challenges the kid to expand their vocabulary and their linguistic skills. Educational psychologist Carol Gilligan goes on to tell us that fathers stress justice, fairness, and duty based on rules, while mothers stress sympathy, care, and help based on relationships. And he says either of these disciplinary approaches by themselves is not good, but together they create a healthy balance that's so needed. And finally, he says that fathers provide a look at the world of men. Men and women are different. They eat differently, they dress differently, they cope with life differently. And he said girls and boys who grow up with a father are more familiar and secure with the world of men. Girls with involved married fathers are more likely to have healthier relationships with the opposite sex because they learn from their fathers how proper men act toward women. They know which behaviors are inappropriate. Boys who grow up with fathers who are, are less likely to be violent. They have their masculinity affirmed and learn from their fathers how to channel their masculinity and strength in positive ways. And fathers help sons understand proper male sexuality, hygiene, and behavior in age-appropriate ways. Again, those are some highlights of the article that I pulled up. Feel free to go to that. I think it's a great challenge uh, for guys. It also helps our understanding of, of things that occur. And I realize some moms have to be moms and dads, and some dads have to be moms and dads. And I understand that, and uh, that's tough. But I know so many have done a great job, and that's many of you in a less than ideal situation. Studies were done in the Texas prison system a few years ago to find out the role that fathers had played in their lives. And it was interesting to see, but not, not something that was so surprising, that 80% of the prisoners had grown up in homes with absent fathers or had hostile relationships with their dads. It's such an important role to have uh, with, our, with our dads and the role that they are to play in the home. And so I think it's neat when we have a, a day in June, just like we have a day in May for moms, that we have a day in June for dads. And just a, simply a way to say thanks to the dads who have meant so much to us. And certainly I'm blessed to have my dad here today and sharing with us and um, what stories we could tell. But anyway, <clears throat> I don't, I'm just soon you not asking him any stories about me. But anyway... You know, today's message is not just about dads, though. It's, a story, it's something that is important for all of us because I think all of us have to make choices. We have to make decisions. We have to, have to learn and, and, uh, along the way what is, what is important. And today we get the lives of two men, two dads, whose choices profoundly affected their families. And one is, is a warning uh, about poor choices, and the other is encouragement because of wise choices. If you're using your bulletin today, uh, the first point is that Lot made choices that hurt 
his family. Lot made choices that hurt his family. You know, I've often heard the, the simple advice that, that, you know, the best way to button your shirt is to, to start at the bottom and line them up and then all the other buttons are where they ought to be. And uh, it's really a great teaching tool about the importance of the first decision. Those very early decisions that we make to, to try to make the best decisions we can make because it helps line up all the other ones. And uh, so I've always thought that that was helpful advice to myself as well as to others uh, as well. And Lot was somebody who made a very foolish choice early in his life and early in his parenting that, that just really went a bad direction. It began a series of bad choices for him and his life is kind of a warning uh, for us. In Genesis chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, it begins his story as we read here. It says, So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. Verse 5. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. Verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me. Or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot looked up and saw the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt toward Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Lot had a choice here. And Abram was pretty open about it. Abram is his uncle. Uh, he was an older relative. He was someone who had taken care of Lot for, for some time now. And Lot has been blessed because of his association with, with Abram. And so here's a choice. We can't stay together. Our flocks are too large. We need to spread out and, and find pasture and, and kind of go our different ways because our, our flocks and, our, and so forth have gotten to be so large. And so he had a choice. Abram gave him this choice. And we find Lot's choice revealed much about his character. His emphasis, we find, was on himself. He was selfish and greedy. Uh, he wanted the best for himself without considering the needs of his uncle. You think, you know, out of respect to his uncle, he would say, no, uncle, you choose because I respect you and, and, and everything I have is because of you and I've been blessed because of you choose. And I'll just take whatever's left over. Or, or, you know, we don't even find here consideration in his mind and heart of what might be fair. It's just that his eyes looked out and he saw the water, well-watered plain of the Jordan area. And he thought, that's what I want. That's where I want my flocks to be. You know, my uncle can just make do with wherever he is. But he chose the well-watered pastures of the plain, foolishly ignoring his closeness to the people who lived in Sodom. And Sodom's reputation was not a good one. It was a wicked city for a lot of different reasons. But he chose the plain which was near Sodom. And in essence, Lot placed his financial prosper prosperity above his family's spirituality. He was more concerned about gaining for himself, coming more rich, flocks increasing, growing vastly, more than he was a concern for the spiritual uh, emphasis in his family. And I think what is more important in our lives, I think it's good for you and I to sit down and assess what is the most important, what is our greatest priority. And I think if we're not careful, a lot of us would say, well, it's our job. You know, job's kind of king of the hill and every other decision floats from what the job requires. And I understand sometimes that has to work in certain ways, but there's also times when we need to not let it be the very top priority in our lives. We often have decisions in those times of decision. Uh, certainly we can, we, can, uh, we can make godly choices. Hobbies. Hobbies are great things. They're great diversions. But they can't dominate our lives. They can't become more important than our families. And when they do, they become problems. 
what our family needs to see in us as decisions, as dads, as moms, as, as individuals. Things that reflect well upon God. That we're living our lives to please Him. And decisions we make reflect that we want to please Him. And, and our kids see us making decisions along that line. Uh, that they see us making worship as a family and personally a priority. And they see us making those kinds of decisions. You know, Lot chose an unsafe environment for his family. He expected his family to live near Sodom and not be like Sodom. He thought he could live nearby a place like Sodom and not be influenced by it. And, and, not, and not seeing his family be influenced by that. You know, it's kind of like, you know, what do we let in our homes? What do we think we can live near? What do we think, you know, we can allow within our families and not negatively influence us? And a lot of times as parents, we need to be gatekeepers and we need to think about atmospheres and, and schools and neighborhoods and, and churches and all those kinds of things that we want to be a valuable part of our kids' experience. And some environments aren't good and they'd be steered away from. Lots mental transformation deeper into problems was so slow he really probably didn't even notice it. In Genesis chapter 13 and verse 12 we just read where he pitched his tents near Sodom. But in chapter 19 he's living in Sodom. So the guy who first thought he could live nearby and not be influenced now is living in the city of Sodom. And chapter 19 opens with him sitting in the gate. Which in Bible times this signified that he was one of the leaders of the city. So not only did he go from living out somewhere nearby and not wanting to be influenced by it. Now he's not only living in the city, he's a leader in the city. And we know that business transactions were, were handled there. And the courts met there. This is where decisions of, of legal and financial matters were made. We saw this in the book of Ruth when Boaz took his, his concerns and his uh, business uh, to the leaders at the city gate. You know, perhaps in, in looking at this, maybe through Lot, trying to be an a, you know, optimistic person, maybe he thought he could move into the city and make it a better place. You know, maybe he thought that, you know, he could go in and influence the, the people in this city and, and make a positive influence for them. And, and sometimes that happens. You know, Jesus told us to be salt and light, you know, in the world. And, you know, that we should be a positive influence and we should shine light in darkness and, and do those kinds of things. But we know that Lot didn't bring change. Lot changed. And that wasn't at all, I think, what he intended. But he came, became so entangled in the way of life in this city. His life and his roots had gotten so deep in the city. This was his life. His family was there. That he found it hard to leave. Even when the Lord told him he was about to destroy the city. Because of the wickedness of the city. In Genesis 19 verse 15. It said with the coming of dawn the angels urged Lot saying. Hurry take your wife and your two daughters who are here. And you or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. Wow. If the Lord told you he was going to destroy a place, would you linger there? You'd think not. But Lot had become so much a part of that environment. That was his home. That's where his family was. That's where his business was. He was respected there. On and on and on the list goes. And here the Bible plainly says that when the men came, he hesitated. He had to think, is this what I really want to do? And the Bible says the Lord was merciful. I see these angels grabbing Lot's arms and the arms of his family. And maybe for the first few steps, drug them. Away from this city. I'd like to think he just went along eventually. But I'm not so sure reading the text. Let's see. You're on the Titanic. And you feel the jarring of this large ship that you're sailing on. When it hits something. And your natural curiosity would be to look at each other and say what was that? 
probably your curiosity would lead you to the deck of the ship because you would want to know what was going on. And when you get to the upper deck, you look around and you see four guys that are talking. And the first guy says, we've hit an iceberg. There's a gaping hole down below the water line. And we're taking in water. And we're going to go down in about two hours. And we need to get as many people on lifeboats as we can. Because there's not enough boats for everyone. But the second guy looks at him and says, no, no, no. That's such a negative message. I mean, you're spreading gloom needlessly. This ship is large. It's the unsinkable ship. It's never going to sink. Come on. The third guy says, well, I think there's going to be other ships responding to us quickly. And so why don't we just wait till they get here? It's pretty dangerous to put life in people in lifeboats with a rough sea. We're going to lose more people trying to get them in lifeboat than we would, we would waiting on ships to come rescue us. But the fourth guy says, hey, let's get a crew together and let's go down and patch the hole ourselves. Let's save this ship and do it ourselves. Now, which of these four people are you going to listen to? The one you listen to is going to determine whether you're saved or not. The one you listen to is going to determine whether your family is saved or not. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The first guy's the captain of the ship. He's examined the damage. He knows how much time people have. And he says we need to get to the lifeboats as quick as we can. Now if you were wise, you would listen to him. Because he knows what's best. And even though it might be frightening counsel, and it might be words you'd rather not hear, and the danger probably frightens you, but he has told you the way to get off the ship. Now Lot was talking to the captain, in essence here. And he's saying, this is the only way you're going to get out. And Lot hesitated. It's not wise to hesitate when the Lord speaks. Let's turn over quickly to Job. Because Job's choice has helped his family. His choice has helped his family. I like the words of Austin Sorensen who said, A child is not likely to find a father in God unless he finds something of God in his father. When Job's children looked at him, they saw something of God. In Job chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. His quiver was full, huh? But they saw in their dad a man who, who feared God. He turned from evil because of his relationship to God. And they watched this. So what made Job a successful dad? Well, first of all, I think he gave consistent attention to his family priorities. According to verse 5, he got up every early every morning and offered a sacrifice to God for each of his children. Today, this would be like taking your children one by one by name and offering a prayer in their behalf. Taking whatever child you choose first, young, oldest, youngest, whichever is the most trouble to you at the moment, I don't really know. But, you know, you begin with them and you offer a very specific prayer through your understanding of their life situation. And then you move to your next child and so forth. And you offer a specific prayer to God for each of these children. Because they are that important to you. And you want to bring their needs before God. It's a great practice to do for all of us today and every day. But Job understood the priority of time spent with his children and for his children. I was reading this week about a biographer named Boswell, who always remembered the day his dad took off work and took him fishing. To him, that was the greatest day he could remember. 
But when his dad died and he read his dad's journal, he found this entry. Gone fishing today with my son. Another day wasted. A little boy fell down, scraped his knee. First thing he did was to look up at his dad who was nearby. And he said, Dad, I hurt my knee. No response. He said again, Dad, I hurt my knee. No response. Finally he says, Dad, I hurt my knee. His dad looked over him. He says, well, what do you want me to do? And the boy, little boy looked at him and said, well, you could say, oh. He was just looking for some attention. <laughs> the story of a dad who was always bringing work home. And every time his son would say, dad, let's go play ball. Dad, let's wrestle in the living room. Dad, let's, he would always say, you know, son, I, I didn't get everything done at work today. And I had to bring it home and I got to get it done because I have, it, I have to have it done by tomorrow. I got to do it now. And after several times of this, his, his son finally looked at him and said, Dad, why don't you tell them to put you in a slower group? <laughs> no, not everybody gets the time with kids thing. And probably any parent whose kids are grown can look back with regrets over decisions that they made during that time. But it's just important to use what time you have now. Not just beat yourself up over your past. But to understand the importance of time now. I think it's important when your kids come around now to put on your phone. Stop watching ESPN. Just listen to them. I don't know what it is about kids, but I don't know how you feel when you're talking to somebody and they're doing this. You're kind of like, well, I'm getting half an ear. Or they're watching television, or they're whatever. You know, it's just, I, I think sometimes we have to kind of, and I, I don't see us all the time until it happens to me sometimes, and just to think, let's just give them our full attention. I don't care if they're grown, I don't care if they're three, I don't care if they're 45. There's just something about saying, I'm all yours. How can you best say in this moment, I'm all yours? I say that to myself as well. Job had a plan and he stuck to it. And I think that's another reason he was successful. Job 1.5 says, When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular custom. Job was always afraid that in some way maybe his children had sinned. And in this day and time when the book of Job was written, the, the way to pay for sin was through the sacrifice of a burnt offering. And that's what Job did. That's his understanding of what God required of him to cleanse his children of their sin. And even if they had done so, you know, not even thinking about it. Maybe they had, they had done so in, in a state of mind that they just didn't realize what they were doing. And Job was so concerned about them that he kept bringing their needs before God and offering sacrifices for them because he wanted to make sure that not only did he have time for them, but he was also looking out for them and doing all that he could do. I want to share a video clip with you um, today as we close. And some of you are very familiar with this video clip. Uh, this is a video clip of Derek Redman in the 1992 Olympics. He was competing for a medal for Great Britain in the 400 meter race. Less than halfway through, he ripped a hamstring muscle. And the pain was so great, he fell to the track. And he was just heartbroken as all the other runners continued and they finished the race. No medal for Derek Redman. But Derek Redman got up, started hopping. He was going to finish the race. His country sent him to finish something and he, he was going to finish. But the pain was so great. And all of a sudden this crazy person came out of the stands in blue shirt, uh, shorts white cap that simply said just do it and he 
consoled Derek. It was his dad. And trainers came and security people came. And they tried to get him off the track. And Derek's dad said, ain't no way. We started this together and we're going to finish it together. line to thunderous applause. There probably weren't many dry eyes in the place. It's become one of the most powerful moments in sports. And certainly the story challenges me, it challenges all fathers, it challenges all parents, all grandparents. It challenges in regard to the children in this church family and the children in this community to do everything we can to help our kids finish the race. Even if, especially if they stumble along the way. That's what our Father's done for us. And we need to be the same for the children we know and love. Let's pray together. Father Derek Redman's story reminds us of how many times our dads perhaps had to come alongside of us or our moms and say, I'm with you. I know you've stumbled, but I, I'm with you. I know this is painful, but I'm with you. I'm going to help you finish. And Father, we're grateful for family members like that and church family members like that. They just don't give up on us. But Father, we know that's a reflection of your love. And that's what you extend to us. You just want to wrap your arms around us and help us where we need it the most. And when you know the greatest need we have is for salvation and forgiveness of our sins, the things that interfere in our relationship with you because you are a holy God. But you have made a way through Jesus for us to be restored in relationship to you and his blood covers our sin. And we are so grateful. That secures our present and our eternity and certainly we're grateful for that. But Father, you walk alongside of us in this life as well. And some of us in our own hearts know how desperately we need you today. So Father, it's not only a challenge to dads and moms and grandparents and everybody in this audience today. But it's a reminder of what you want to do for us. Thank you. Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you would like to become a follower of Jesus, you can do that today. It's his invitation. He tells us what to do in, in the scriptures. And certainly, if you are looking for a church home today, the Father invites you. He established the church to be a, a base here on the earth. And, to make commitments to that base and begin to live lives through that base and encouragement and learning and help to each other but also arms open to people who come to him for needing the very same things and so today if you're not a member of a family a church family we'd invite you to come be here a part of this family if you've never really received Jesus as your Lord and Savior today it would be a perfect day to do that on this Father's Day you can honor him to the decisions that you make today and begin from this point to make decisions that honor and reflect him in a greater way. It's a challenge to all of us really and he's, he'll start with us today. 
If you have a public decision, I'll be down front to greet you. If you'd like to talk to me or one of the staff or the elders at the back tables, I'd be happy to do that with you today. If you need somebody to pray with you, to share with you, to talk to you, we'd be more than happy to do that today. Would you stand with us today as we worship? Uh, Jerry and Tammy Wright and they are uh, already believers in the Lord Jesus and they have followed the things the New Testament asks of them to become a member of the Lord's family. And so today we officially welcome them and their uh, family to our church uh, today as, as part of us. And they have placed their influence here with us and been worshiping with us for, for some time now. And doing those things that people need to do, which is to kind of learn about a family. And learn about is this a good, good place for us to be? Is this a place not only can we be fed as a family, but can we serve here? Are there things that we can do and use our gifts and our abilities to make this family stronger? And those are things that we want anyone to do. And so Jerry and Tammy, I just welcome you today. I know you love Jesus. I know that you want to serve him. And um, you, you strive to do that every day of your life. But like the rest of us, you've learned we're not perfect at it. And lo, we need the Lord's help uh, so much. And that's where church families, God uses to be a strengthening agent, an encouraging agent. And we want to be that for you. And we just ask that if any way uh, we offend you, some way we upset you, please come and at least speak to us and just say, hey, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, because a lot of times we find that problems are just the miscommunication. We just don't know things. We make assumptions. And we get in trouble in our marriages for the same reason. So uh, I speak from experience. But anyway, <clears throat> um, my wife will vouch for that. But anyway, uh, but that just speaks to our imperfections as people. But I know you love Jesus. And I'm just going to ask you before your new church family, if you repeat after me, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I have accepted him. And I have accepted him. As my Savior and my Lord. As my Savior and my Lord. Amen. Let's pray for our new family. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the message of salvation that Jesus brought into this world. How vividly he showed us that love. We know that before he left, he instituted the church. And we know that his disciples, his followers, the apostles were used of the Holy Spirit to launch a church. The Father has continued down through to our generation. And Father, we're so grateful because you know how much we need to belong. You know how much we need encouragement and help. Father, we need to be a, a base in a community where we are found any place in this world to reach out to other people and to show them Jesus, but also to help strengthen those within the family of believers that we can be the best witnesses, the best moms and dads, the best workers, the best neighbors that we could possibly be. Why? Because we want to bring positive witness to Jesus Christ. But Father, we're flawed people. And we so much need your help. And we're so thankful for the ways you provide that. I thank you for Jerry and Tammy's life. I thank you for their family. I thank you for the hearts they have for you and their desire to worship you and serve you. And Father, to belong to a family in the truest of, of ways. Uh, Father, may our arms encircle them. May we grow in our walk with you and our service to each other and to this community. May we become just the loving hub of Christ in this community that you desire us to be. Guide them, Father, in their decisions. Guide them, Father, in their marriage, in their parenting. Father, as they work, I just pray, Father, that they would daily look to you as they do. And you would continue to guide and help them and strengthen them. And to always let them know your presence is with them. So we welcome them and our arms encircle them. And Father, may we grow close in our work and labors for you. And Father, as we do, we'll grow closer to you. And we're so thankful for that. And it's in the blessed name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay. If y'all mind being seated, let people greet you. I'm just going to ask them to remain up front today and uh, make it easier for you to find them. And, and please come and give them the welcome that you always do with people that become a part of this family. And uh, let them know who you are. And... Um, 
just give them a warm welcome as you folks do so greatly. So thanks so much for that.